Hi, can everyone hear me? That's good. <laughs> Will we be good to go on time? I guess it's uh, 8.30 here at least. Yeah, he's on stage already. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Welcome to the session. My name is Niels Meyer Kralen from Aalto University, and I'm happy to chair this session about XR audio reproduction and perception. First of all, thanks to the organizers again for making this full VR conference. I think it's a really great experience for, for all of us. And Okay, let's start. Um, the first speaker is Lear Matmoni from Ben-Gurion University, and he will speak about beamforming-based binaural reproduction by matching of binaural signals. And if I understand correctly, all the ambisonic fans will have to be very strong now because uh, I think his method will uh, will be a way of binaural reproduction without encoding microphone signals into the ambisonics domain or SH domain explicitly. But if I got it wrong, he will probably correct me. So the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, that's about right. Uh, first of all, can anyone hear me? Great. So thank you for joining in. Um, so I'm Lior and um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so let's just begin. I'll start with a brief outline about what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to give a very short introduction to binaural reproduction, especially because this is the third day of the conference and it's probably things that you have already know. Uh, I will then present two approaches for binaural reproduction. Also briefly, the plane wave decomposition approach, which is uh, based on the ambisonics format and the beamforming based approach. Uh, we will then continue talking mainly about the beamforming approach where I'll be presenting current advances and limitations uh, in the design of such systems. And then I will be present um, our proposed approach um, for uh, how to perform binaural reproduction, mainly with uh, general arrays where we don't have a lot of um, uh, directional uh, resolution. I will then present some uh, simulation results and we'll conclude the talk. So let's begin talking very briefly about what is binaural reproduction. Uh, very simply, I, I have a, system, a basic system here uh, just to, to uh, emphasize that what we need in order to perform the binaural re reproduction is both the sound field and the head-related transfer uh, functions or the uh, HRTFs, which will be denoted by H throughout this talk with um, L and R for the left and right ears. Um, then the binaural reproduction system takes these two components, combine them somehow to, to produce the binaural si si uh, signals, which will be denoted by P. So uh, one way to do that is to simulate. One way yeah, to do that is to simulate the sound field using a computer, which means that we uh, simulate or generate uh, the plane wave density function, uh, which is a function of um, frequency and direction. And another way to uh, perform uh, the binaural reproduction is with uh, in real environments. Yeah, using uh, measurements. So in this case, we have some kind of acoustic environment and a microphone array, which is depicted by these um, um, microphones. And then what we get from this system is some kind of uh, pressure, which is me me uh, measured by the microphone, uh, by the microphone array, which will be uh, in here denoted by this vector x. And our main concern in this talk is how do we go uh, from the microphone signals to the binaural signals, um, currently assuming that we have the HRTF somehow. So this will be less of a concern uh, in this work. So as I said, uh, one of the very common approaches is to perform plane wave decomposition, meaning that we take the microphone signals and basically estimate the plane wave density function for each direction or uh, frequency that we are uh, a, a, uh, able to perform this estimation. And then we simply multiply the HRTFs with the estimated binaural signals 
some of the contribution of all um, throughout all uh, their, their directional space and get the binaural signals. Um, this can also be formulated in the spherical harmonics domain, where we simply have the spherical Fourier transform coefficients of the sound field and of the HRTFs. And this is also known as the ambisonics format, which is well studied and understood. However, usually it requires a relatively complex array, like a spherical array. Um, so um, another approach, which is more flexible in terms of the array the different uh, outputs for each of the beamformers. And at the next stage, we simply multiply each of the outputs by some kind of a scaling factor, <clears throat> which will be denoted by uh, these uh, alphas. And we also multiply it by the corresponding HRTFs from the look directions, which correspond to the, sorry, from the directions which correspond to the look directions of the beamformers. And then we sum the contribution from all of the directions and the output is our estimated bin binaural signal. So, uh, we can write down the equation for this uh, block diagram uh, with this one here, and um, we will see that in later slides. And the uses for this, as I said, it is less limited in terms of the array that we can use it with, and we can also design the beamformer to enhance or attenuate some signals from uh, different uh, directions. So let's keep on talking a little more about specific applications that could use this uh, approach. So uh, the first one would be for wearable arrays, where, for instance, we are um, we have par uh, participated in some kind of an acoustic environment, and we have captured this acoustic, uh, this acoustic environment in order to re-experience this sometime uh, later. Similar that uh, when we do with videos, for example, we can also maybe share this experience in some platforms that may um, may uh, uh, support this uh, kind of a format. And another different application um, would be for assisted uh, li listening, where we have a very noisy environment and we would like to focus our, on our attention on some kind of source, maybe a speaker or maybe attenuate uh, other noise from different uh, di directions. And for other uh, devices, such as uh, mobile uh, de de devices, uh, we can use su such an approach uh, in teleconferencing, for example, or basically any other entertainment-based um, uh, application which uses um, binaural signals. Okay, so from here, let's go talk about some uh, literature review in this topic. And here I have a list of some works, some examples for works that use this method to generate binaural signals. And um, if we would go over and read a lot of the recent works, we will still be left with a lot of question marks regarding how exactly do we design such a system. So I have the equation that basically tells us most of the parameters we need for the design, but if we would go over the works, we would still, it would still not be clear how exactly we need to choose the number of beamformers, uh, the scaling factors, the steering directions themselves, and also the beamformer type. And maybe more importantly is that we, it is still not clear how each of these parameters actually um, affects the quality of the reproduced uh, sound. So let's continue a little bit with the literature review where I'll be presenting a summary of recent work to try to answer some of those questions that I uh, just uh, stated. So I've listed the questions in this table and uh, the work that I'm talking about is listed here. So um, basically in this work, they, they divided their analysis to two types of arrays, for spherical arrays and for more general arrays. And um, for spherical arrays, they have showed uh, some conditions that help us to, de to design the system. And let's go over them very briefly. So as, as, as they showed, uh, if we would use a spherical array with a spherical harmonic order of uh, Na, where, uh, we, which is the spherical harmonics of the sound field, and we would use uh, maximum directivity beamformers, and we will choose the um, steering directions to correspond to a sampling scheme on the sphere, which is aliasing free up to spherical harmonic order of ND, which is the maximum between the spherical harmonic order of the HRTFs and of the sound field. 
then if these uh, three conditions are met, then our uh, design of the beam forming based um, uh, system that produces the binaural signals, which is this BFBR here, it would be equivalent to performing the plane wave decomposition, which means that we will get, we will get the uh, ambisonic signal at the output. So this actually answers a lot of the questions that I've written uh, below, because it tells us exactly how to design um, the system, and also we have a very good understanding about the quality of the reproduced sound, because we would get the ambisonic signal at the output, which is very uh, well studied. Um, so this is the case for the spherical array, and for the for more general arrays, um, the analysis try to answer or give some gu some guideline on how do we choose the number of directions when we use general arrays. And um, in this case, what they've shown is that we can use the directivity factor of the maximum directivity beamformer in order to know how many directions we will probably need in order to get a high quality re a reproduction. And what they have shown is that this number of beamformers uh, of maximum directivity beamformers specifically should be very similar to the average directivity factor uh, where the averaging is performed over all uh, directions. Now this may be a, f a function of frequency and um, yeah, so at least for the maximum directivity beamformer, when used with general arrays, we have some idea on how do we exactly need to choose the number of directions or number of beamformers. But for all of the other uh, questions, this is still not clear. Uh, general arrays are maybe more complex in order to understand carefully how, how, how do we need to choose all of these parameters and how exactly this will affect the reproduced sound. So what we try to do, which is what I'll be presenting now, is uh, to take on a different approach where the aim is to extend this framework, so, so get a very, um, uh, a very well um, uh, theoretical framework to how to design such a system or any system to produce binaural reproduction where the aim is to focus on general arrays meaning that um, uh, they don't have to be spherical. Uh, for example, this could be very uh, relevant for wearable arrays, and our directional resolution may be very limited, such that uh, we are not expecting to get a higher order ambisonic signal since it's not possible with such small arrays. And our approach is to estimate the binaural signals directly from the microphones, and we will do that by assuming that the sound field is comprised of uh, capital D different sources, which are uh, independent from one, one another and identically distributed. So this may, be seem, this may seem like a limitation at first. However, it can be shown that if we would get a um, binaural signal with very low error in the, in the estimate, with very low estimation error, then um, this could be the same approach can be used uh, with uh, a lot of different sound fields. So it's not really a limitation. However, the exact der derivation of the proof uh, is, is, is left out of the scope of this paper. Okay, so let's now see the proposed uh, method. First, I'll present some of the models that we use in order to develop the method. So what I have here on the left is the array measurements or the model that we used for the array measurements. Uh, v here is the steering matrix between, between each of the sources to the microphones. Uh, the vector S here holds the amplitudes or the signals for each of the D sources. And I will also be using the signal power and noise power denoted by sigma S squared and sigma N squared, respectively. Uh, but we don't really need to estimate them. This is just going to help us with the robustness of um, our approach. And on the right here, um, this would be the true model of the binaural signals, assuming that the sound field is indeed comprised of D uh, different sources. So this is simply the inner product between the vector containing the HRTFs from the corresponding directions and the source of amplitude. So what we do first is we filter the microphone signals or perform linear estimation. The filter coefficients will be denoted C and this will be for performed for the left and right ears separately. And um, the output of this uh, first block is simply the inner product between the filter and the microphone signals. 
I have also denoted this as p hat, meaning that this is going to be the um, estimated binaural signal, but this will only correspond to a really good uh, binaural signal if we choose C uh, um, carefully. So how will we choose C? We will first uh, subtract the estimated binaural signal from the true model of the binaural signals, and we will find C we will find C that minimizes the MSC of this expression. And if we will do that, if we will do that, we will get the following expression. So we can see here that, first of all, uh, it could be easily extended to various HRTFs since we just need to uh, replace this vector of HRTFs with a different one. And it also supports head rotation by changing uh, the steering matrix uh, correspondingly. And then here you can see why I needed to know something about the signal power and noise power, but this is just to make this inversion more robust. However, if we will have this information, uh, this could uh, uh, help the estimation and also um, there are other methods for performing this regularization. Now, this is not a new formulation. Of course, uh, it was uh, proposed that uh, be before and specifically for binaural reproduction. However, usually it is studied in the context of sound field control. And when it was studied with estimating binaural signals, um, it was usually studied with spherical microphone arrays. So once again, we have focused here on more general arrays, which may be limited in resolution. So let's now see briefly um, <clears throat> some performance measures for this proposed me uh, me method. And what we see here is the normalized error of the binaural signal. Uh, if we will plug in the expressions from the previous slide, we will, guess, we will get the following expression. So we have some kind of a weighting here between these two terms. Now, next, let's assume that the SNR is sufficiently large such, such that we can neglect this part here. And we will be left with this expression. This sigma s squared uh, cancels out and we are left with this expression. And as we can see, if the SNR is high, we don't have a lot of influence on the, um, of, uh, about uh, the, the, the signal and the noise powers. And uh, what we can see from here is that basically this filter C is trying to do some kind of a um, matching between the steering vectors and the HRTFs. So this could be also thought of as the error of estimating the HRTFs from the array um, steering vectors. And that's one of the reasons why we call this uh, error as a matching of the binaural signals. Okay, so let's go over some simulation results. I'll begin by um, presenting re uh, simulation we did with the spherical array. And in this case, I simulated a rigid spherical array with 32 microphones uh, with 4.2 centimeters radius. And the SNR that we assumed in order to um, to um, calculate the coefficient is 20 dB. And we, I, in here I studied the K100 dummy head uh, for the HRTFs. Now the source uh, directions were uh, nearly uniform um, in a spiral scheme with different number of sources. We will see that on the next slide. And what we will be studying is the error of the reproduction. So we see here this normalized error as a function of frequency and the scale is in dB. And because it is a normalized error, then 0 dB is a very large error, but minus 15 and minus 20 dB and below is very small error. And what we see here is the error for the case when the acoustic environment is comprised of 240 sources. And we see that um, there is a... Sorry, yeah. So we see that at the lower frequency range, at approximately below 2 kilohertz, there is a very small error, but at the higher frequencies, there, there is a very large error. And um, the next thing that we uh, can study is uh, what this error will be if the environment was less, com was less complex and it would be comprised of less sources. So looking at the same error plot, but when, when, when the number of sources is decreasing for 32 in this example, we see that the error is decreasing at the higher frequencies. 
And also when we decrease it further to 20 sources or only six sources, we see that we have a very, a very accurate estimation in the entire frequency range. Now what we can do here is uh, basically maybe think about a way to uh, estimate the binaural signals um, with different filters depending on frequencies. So at the lower frequencies, we can get a very accurate in, um, estimation for very uh, complex sound fields. So we will use the filters that correspond to a lot of the sound sources. And as the frequency increase, we will maybe need to choose a sparser direction grid when we use the, when we calculate the filters. So this means that it will not be able to um, reproduce more complex sound fields, but this is expected to be somewhat limited at higher frequencies. Now, I said that we are very interested in general arrays, so let's see the case of a much more compact and simple array comprised of only six microphones uh, arranged in this uh, semicircular um, um, ge uh, geometry. And in here, it was mounted on a spherical array just to represent some kind of a wearable array, for example. And other than the array, all of the other parameters are similar to the previous uh, simulation. So the same, S the same uh, uh, SNR was used, uh, assumed the same HRTFs and source di di directions. So looking at the same error, and once again, for the case of the complex acoustic environments with 240 sources, we once again receive a relatively uh, uh, low errors at the lower frequency range, this time smaller than 1.5 kilohertz. And we see that as, we, as the frequency increase, as expected, we get um, higher errors. But if once again, we will study what happens when the environment is less complex, containing much less sources like 32 or 20, we don't see a lot of change. So there is still very light, large errors in these cases, which makes sense because this array is much more um, it, it, it is much more simple, and its uh, resolution is much more limited than the this, than this spherical array. However, if we will keep on uh, decreasing the number of sources to six sources, uh, we are getting we are starting to get lower errors. And once again, maybe we will use with this array a uh, sparser di di directions grid. Um, so this is starting to look like the beamforming based approach, where we have just um, a uh, very small maybe set of directions where we are trying to reproduce the sound field from, or at least at the higher frequencies. Okay, so to conclude, we saw that uh, for the beamforming based approach, we have a very developed theoretical framework for spherical arrays, but with uh, other types of arrays, it is much more limited. So our proposed, uh, our proposed method was to directly minimize the binaural signal error. And we indeed got a relatively small error uh, at a limited frequency range, but this method supports head rotation. It, it could be easily extended to different HRTFs. Now it was not shown here, but uh, we are still, uh, it is still work in progress. We have some listening tests and we are getting relatively promising uh, reproduction uh, with high quality, even with a much smaller array. Now for future work, except of uh, um, performing the listening test uh, more formally, uh, we will also like to develop the theoretical uh, framework further and get an accurate conditions to when the estimation can be exact with general arrays and also to develop a method that could uh, give us some guidelines on how to choose the number of sources that we assume in order to calculate the filters, which will probably depend on frequency as we saw, and uh, of course study the performance with more HRTF databases. So that was all. Thank you very much for listening. Right. Thanks a lot for your talk. Thank you. Very interesting. Do we have any questions from the audience? I see a raise your hand button on the right side of your screen if you'd like to ask questions. No questions. Oh, we have one. Nick, go ahead and ask. Hey, hi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I, I'm a student at uh, Penn State, so not a professional expert. And so I just wanted to ask something for my clarification and understanding, if I, since there's no other questions. Um, yeah, sure. So 
uh, with this approach, then it sounds similar to kind of a spherical harmonic ambisonics based approach, but with a different kind of weighting matrix that is more general. So would you consider the uh, ambisonics approach kind of like a subset of this more broad theory or is it distinct? So I guess there are some conditions under which uh, the two may be uh, very similar, similar to when we use maximum directivity beamformers, we may get uh, ambisonic signal at the output. However, in this case, uh, the aim was to study arrays where it will be very difficult um, but we are actually currently working on trying to develop the, the framework uh, even further to have more exact um, 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 for uh, exact uh, conditions on when the, ex the estimation will be exact. And when it will be exact, it may be similar to the ambisonic. So I, uh, th there will be some conditions where the two are similar, but I think that in terms of the design of the system, it will be a different approach because it will also enable to give something at least with low error uh, when you can't really have any uh, uh, accurate estimation of the ambisonic signal. I hope this answers your question somehow. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, perfect. Thank you. Are there any further questions? All right, uh, there is one from Ayrton. Go ahead and ask your question. Okay, um, thank you for the talk. I'm also a student. I would like to ask about this uh, filter coefficients that you are using. Are you considering also maybe a adaptive filtering on further, uh, on another, maybe uh, another study? And if so, uh, which type of adaptive filtering are you considering? Okay, so this is um, a good question. If we'll go back looking at the expression for the filters, I will explain what we are currently working on, but this could very well be extended to uh, some of the things that you have proposed. So basically, um, what we see uh, in this term is uh, the assumption of the sound fields, which are uh, ident independent from one another. However, if we will have some information or a way to estimate the covariance matrix of the signal and the noise, then we can plug it in in this uh, in, uh, in, in, instead of this um, matrix here, uh, and then maybe get a better estimation when we have this information. However, uh, this is something for future work because currently we are um, we want to show that even if we do this assumption that. Uh, that the sources are uncorrelated, basically, then we can still have a very accurate estimation, even if the sound field is different. And uh, we have also we have started to get some results. We see the conditions, and uh, maybe when these conditions are not met, then we can do something similar to what you proposed, using uh, an adaptive um, estimation of the covariance matrices of the signal and the noise, and this could uh, very well improve the performance in this case. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you very okay, much. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Thank you for your answers. Let's give another round of, of applause and then we should move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Okay, I think our um, session chair, Niels, might be re-entering the space. He was having a, a little bit of trouble. Uh, I'm here. Ah, he's here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no worries. 
Yeah, I guess you need to go on air as well and also amplify your voice. Everything all right? Since I don't see Matan, um, it's possible that he's here, but he is not on air. So Matan, I, if you can hear me. I can see him. Ah, okay, good. So um, Matan, could you make sure that you are on air if you go under host tools and then uh, click that radio uh, tower button? Yep, we are on air. Okay. And I guess we're good to go. Yeah, can you see me? I can. Um, Dustin, right. sorry. Are we good to go, Dustin? Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. All right, then let's go. The next speaker is Maton Ben Asher, and he is from Waves in Israel, I guess, and um, he will be giving a talk called Virtual Reality Music in the Real World, and he will address certain issues about head tracking and rotation with respect to train movements and, and things like that. I'm looking forward to it. Let's go. Right. Hello, everyone. I'm Matan from Waves, um, and I'll be presenting a paper on virtual reality music in the real world. Um, I'll start by saying that the real world, world was a very different place when we uh, when we wrote this paper, obviously, and we uh, and when we um, it's still highly relevant as you'll see in the items. A lot of the stuff is uh, relevant. Um, uh, Matan, sorry, yes. yes, Matan, excuse me, sorry. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I think you're amplified. Are you? If you select yes, that, now I am. Tools. Okay. Now, yeah. now I'm and amplified. Also, now it might be an issue. It might be an issue of your microphone. Uh, I think when you're turning your okay. head away from the microphone, uh, we're losing you a little bit, but otherwise, it sounds great. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm with the quest. Uh, now amplified. Um, so the paper will be, um, the, 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 uh, the paper discusses um, um, an issue that uh, was not discussed so far. Uh, we're not going to be talking about audio processing at all. We're going to be talking about the pre processing aspects of head tracking when you want to use it, uh, when you want to apply it um, to binaural audio. And uh, as most of you are familiar, this is a big deal. Uh, it's been happening for quite quite a while now. Um, and let's just begin. Um, let me advance this slide here. So, um, binaural rendering uh, with head tracking. So, uh, I won't um, elaborate too much on binaural rendering because we've been around the third day in here and everybody was talking about it. Um, but we do know that uh, binaural rendering involves um, the, uh, um, the apply, when we apply binaural cues, which are ITD and ILD and other um, binaural cues in order to present a source, a virtual source in some location in space, in some fixed lo location in space. And we also know that head tracking is very important to this aspect because all of these cues and all of these filters that are applied, um, HRTF that we discussed in this and, and other items that happens in the room, the room reflections, the, the response of the room to, to um, where you are relative to other objects and other people, that all changes when you rotate your head, obviously, and when you uh, move around. So um, this is what head tracking does, head tracking in the first degree, it starts, it, what it, it attempts to do is position a source and a static relative to your uh, head motion. And head tracking is typically um, can be done in the six degrees of freedom. So we just talk about X, Y, Z um, on translation and also in Yacht Patrol. And you can also talk about, um, you can also describe orientation in quaternions um, and in other forms. Um, and uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, we'll see, um, and, th and this actually uh, combines with the, the, what was talked about before in the previous talks about the list of the creator's intent versus um, what the listener is hearing. So when we're talking about music and also film, this, uh, most of this content is all created in studios 
either in, um, in um, uh, studios that have surround, a surround system or uh, uh, stereo speakers. And, um, and they're all being done by these mixing engineers and the artists while sitting in a sweet spot and listening to a real, um, a real studio speakers. So when, uh, when we consume content that, that is stereo 5.1, 7.1, and all of this content, we need to keep in mind that this content was created in, with some kind, in some kind of an environment. And that is um, the intent of the artist was projected into this environment. And um, so then when we recreate uh, a binaural audio, um, and this is what we did with our uh, first product that connects with the uh, Pro Audio plugin, um, we ideally want to create a set of virtual loudspeakers, which are similar to where this uh, content was created. The virtual loudspeakers um, um, will emulate the loudspeakers in the mix room using a binaural rendering. And, um, and this, this, this helps both the studio engineers and, but also on the consumer um, the consumer side, the, the studio engineers in our first product were using this uh, NX2 to to, um, to do their mixing when they're not in the studio. So they were they needed to have a virtual sort of studio when they were working from home, uh, as we all do right now, or a lot of us do right now, and that we're on the go, and uh, would still simulate that same feel of the studio where the, the speakers are in that position and um, and, um, and and mix like that. Uh, but in the consumer space, it's 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 also very similar because you know that the the engineer was the, when he was creating this content, um, you want to reproduce the same environment. Um, so this is um, the ideal listening or in the intended listening environment when we're talking about the existing formats of of audio um, for film and for for music as well. Now. Now, the way we, we do it, um, and, and, and it's similar to other technologies, you know, we actually use parametric HRTF simulation. This, this allows us, instead of measuring HRTFs, this allows us to actually optimize, to personalize HRTFs to some degree uh, of, the, of the user's, uh, user's dimensions. Um, and we this simulate these uh, virtual loudspeakers. Um, but we also need to add the room simulation, and the room simulation is a big deal because you need to decide which room you want to simulate this user. Uh, you want to, do you want to simulate the room that he's in, he or she are in, or do you want to uh, simulate uh, the studio or, or the, the studio that was created in, or do you want to create some optimal uh, environment? And we did some of this and some of that. In the first product, it was, was this optimal uh, space, and in the Abbey Road Studio uh, product, it was, it was uh, sim simulating uh, the actual Abbey Road Studio 3. Um, and now, um, in, in, in the case of head tracking, Head tracking you can do with either IMUs or cameras, and some of you are familiar with with uh, these items. And also, you know, we know we're wearing a headset, so obviously head tracking is happening with a lot of sensors. Uh, but the uh, it, it can be with six degrees of freedom or three degrees of freedom, and you can do a combination of, of tracking, so you can increase the rate of the tracker. These are all things that affect um, the the experience uh, very strongly, especially with audio, even more than with, uh, with visuals. And and and. That was it for for the product where, where we, we were talking about the um, the mixing room or the for the professionals. Um, we were talking about uh, simulating a room and uh, the speakers, and we were also uh, doing head tracking. Now uh, let's pause here and ask ourselves the question: When you do head tracking, and if, if if anyone has ever attempted to do this kind of technology before, you realize very quickly that um, that that head tracking means you're getting a degree of the head. An orientation of the head, uh, and you want to virtualize a source relative to that head. But when you're getting the, the orientation of the head, it's relative to some um, reference. It's relative to some, usually a static reference. It's w whether whether the, the IMU when you turned it on where it was pointing, or is it magnetic north, or if it's a camera, it's usually where the camera is facing. But anyway, when you're getting when you're getting head tracking uh, information or tracking information, it's relative to a reference. And and when you virtualize a uh, um, when you virtualize a sound source and, and, and you're in the real world, you're looking outside and you're seeing physical objects, you're not in a VR environment, you're in the real world, you're trying to virtualize a, a sound source in a physical place, in a real physical place, a virtual source, like uh, an augmented uh, reality. So you're usually doing this, um, and you have to decide where your forward is in the real world, where your forward is, and place all the objects relative to that um, Place the relative to that forward. Now, in the in the studio product, this is not a problem because uh, because the studio engineer when they're doing uh, when they're doing a mix, they're sitting down and they're um, and they're attempting to mix, 
and they just decide, okay, the, the, my speakers need to be here in the forward. Now I fix them here. I, I press calibrate. We have like a button, a sweet spot, a sweet spot, and now they're here for the rest of the session, and that, that that's good enough. I don't need them to move around um, when I'm when I'm doing the mix. Or even better, um, some of them even use this a little even to, to some extent. They they move to like a keyboard if they have like a, like a piano or something next to them, and they're they're playing the the, the MIDI keyboard, and then rather than the speaker still coming from that direction uh, from the from from the from the front. They can recalibrate and have the speakers have them facing in front of them. So this is like a manual sort of way of, of positioning speakers. And so as long as you're static, this is all great. But what happens when you're in motion? What happens when you want to render a binaural of 5.1, 7.1, or just stereo? Uh, and, and the listener is outside, is in a train, a train is moving around the car, or in, on a, riding a bicycle. And uh, or walking around in the street. Now, what happens if I fix the source to a static position? Then, uh, then the, the speakers will be in front of me as long as I'm moving in, in, in the same direction that I was moving. But then, when I turn a street corner, um, that the speakers will be on the side because there's head tracking, and so the head tracking keeps them constant here. And now I'm walking in another direction, and I have my speakers stuck on my side. And I, I don't want this kind of behavior probably. Uh, and so, and that's only one example. There's tons of examples where this is this becomes a problem. You have a train riding, and the train is slowly shifting to the left, or slowly shifting to the right. If you have head tracking with an IMU and you're not recalibrating your reference, then it's 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 going to be causing the, the speakers to sort of drift around, move around you, because the head tracker does not know if uh, if it's if it's your head motion that you want to do head tracking relative to, or you want, or, or the reference is uh, is changing. So um, and we realized quite quick, quite quickly that we need to decide what to do here, and this is not a, a not a technical problem as much as it is a UX sort of decision problem. Because if you think about it, this kind of technology had never, not, not technology, but this kind of experience had never existed before. If we had experiences in a living room and in a, in a studio or in a movie theater, then we were static and the speakers were static and, and we had these speakers externalized and we weren't moving around and it didn't really matter. And if you had, if you wore headphones, um, uh, it was, you know, the, the classic kind of headphones that we still see around every, for most people uh, are the lateralization, they're all, they're all in your head. So there's no, there's no directionality at all anyway. So if there's no directionality, then it doesn't matter which way I'm facing, they're all moving around with. But if you want to have, um, you want to have binaural audio with head tracking, so you want to have this externalization effect. That means that you're creating some augmented reality that's moving around with you in the world, and this augmented reality is um, is, is 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 a is a sound source. So it's not some it's not some um, like here like we have in VR. It's not some icon that's you know sort of tracking you and you can press it. It's your music. It's your audio. You don't want it to to move when it's not supposed to move and you, you need to really ask yourself what do you want to happen when you're actually listening to music or, or consuming a film uh, that is going to be pleasing and it's going to be um, uh, comfortable. So, um, so uh, this is a, the, the first problem, obviously, that we understood that we needed to do was to distinguish between the head motion. When I mean head motion, I mean there's a head tracker and I'm moving my head from side to side. And, and, and I want to do the audio, which, which we all of you probably know with the, with the head tracking, where you have the sources fixed. But when you move your whole body, the head sensor is also detecting this, this rotation. And in that case, you don't want to do that, or you maybe want to do it for a while, and then you want to move it here because you're facing in another direction. And there's, there's combinations of events and, and use cases that when you think about it, um, um, it, it creates a, a big problem. Um, so you need to the first thing you need to do is distinguish them, and that is the first thing that we did is uh, we we decided okay to distinguish between head movements and and reference movement okay let's just add another sensor so we added another sensor meaning we used the sensor on the phone and we did it in our mobile apps that we that we first uh, published so we had um we had um we used the the, the 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 IMU within the phone and the IMU in the sensor and together they work. Uh, to, to make the decision. Now, okay, this is just the hardware aspect of it, which sensor I'm using, but what do I do with this second sensor? How do I use it um, in order to make the experience uh, smooth? And, 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 and this came um, uh, a lot of thinking and experience with actually the first, first products of NX when we did the NX for the virtual studio and the responses that we got from the studio engineers. And the responses that we got from the studio engineers were originally, b before moving reference, before this problem even existed, were, um, were, why are you even doing head tracking? Why are you guys doing this to us? We have, we have you know, waves, we have 
hundreds of thousands of, of, of studio engineers using this technology, some of them doing it for decades and, they're, and, and using headphones for decades. And they asked us, well, why are you giving us this, this strange kind of thing um, that's, that's sort of feeling like the, the speakers are moving around? And, and we told them, okay, but this is how you experience sound in the real world. This is how your studio sounds like. And they said, okay, but I want to be in the sweet spot all the time. I want to be in the, in the sweet spot all the time. Now, what does that mean? I, when they sit in the studio, they, they said they, well, they sit very still and they try to not to move their head at all because they're aware that the, if they move around, the, then the mix changes and they're aware that if they move around, then the, um, then the whole scene, the whole, the, the whole spatial uh, scene changes. So they said, okay, well, we sit still, we don't want to do that. But we, we know, and we know this from, from research, that, that these minor, even the minor head movements are what convince you that the sound is even coming from outside and not from within you because your mind is expecting them to move when you're moving. And this is, uh, this is part of what we're adding, uh, we, we added the head tracking for. Um, and, and that was one step. But from, from that understanding, we realized um, that when you're consuming um, content and you're doing it for the fun of it or for whatever reason, you're consuming audio content, you're expecting it to come from some front, some front. Now, this front uh, is, as we know, it can't be the front attached to your head, right? It can't be headlocked because if it's headlocked, we know that the sound will not be externalized properly and, and, and it's not real and then there's this inner fatigue and so on. Um, but on the other hand, um, it's, it's, um, it, it can't be a headlock, but then what is this front? Where is this front? Is it where my body is facing? Not, not necessarily, when maybe I'm sitting in a train and um, the train is going that way, but I'm sitting on the side of like the subway, I'm sitting on the side of the subway, and the front is still not where my body is facing, it's where my motion is, is, is moving. Um, so we thought maybe, okay, so maybe, maybe, maybe let's detect the direction of where you're moving all the time and then put the front there. But then we realized even more that it's much, there's a much simpler solution that makes more sense from a UX point of view, from a user experience point of view. And that is, if you want the, the front, if you want the sound to come from the front and vice versa, you, uh, you usually look to where the sound comes from. If you're, if you're, you know, you're experiencing um, this, uh, this sound, that, that is the ideal positioning place. Then why not have the sound sort of follow you to the front um, and, and see to it that most of the time uh, the, front, the sound will be in front of you. So that, you know, when you're demoing uh, binaural head tracking, you usually like to do that and, and, and show that the, the, the sound is coming from behind you because it's a very cool effect. But eventually you don't want to listen to music from that direction, or at least not all the time. You want, maybe you want moving sources and stuff like that. But you, if you listen to stereo music, you don't, you don't put it there. Nobody, nobody sits in there purposely in their, in their office or in somewhere and put their, their, their stereo speakers to the side of them. They, they put them in front of them and the same way for, for, for when riding a car and so on. So, so um, and that, what is that front? That front is the average look direction of the head. It's the average look direction of the head and it can be a long average and it can be a short average. But the average look direction of the head, like I'm facing you guys in the audience, I'm looking to some point and there is an average and the sound should come from that place. So we realized that, and that you can do with one sensor. So you have, you have, you have the, the, the moving, the reference following where the head is all the time. Now, what do you do with this second set? What do you do when I, when I take a sharp turn right towards the, the screen or something like this or, or walk in another direction um, without crashing into my, my wall here? Um, the, uh, um, the second sensor, you don't, what we decided uh, to do with this, you can in, uh, get information from that sen second sensor, from the statistics of that se second sensor, that the direction of motion has changed. And you don't care where that direction of motion is, as long as you can get the information of that second sensor, uh, whether it's in your backpack or in your pocket, or you're, you're holding it in your hand and you're wiggling your hand around, you can get information if that pattern has changed. And usually when people are in motion, they have a pattern. That pattern is, should be static, uh, whether it's, 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 it's a pattern when you're, when you could be running or cycling, but there's still a pattern uh, or riding a train. And when, and when there is a change in direction, that pattern changes. And when that pattern changes, those are the points where you want to start moving the reference, recalibrating, so to speak. And, and, and this is what we did. So in this, in, in this diagram, you can see, um, you can see the head sensor and you can see the second sensor at the bottom. The second sensor is doing some sort of, sort of like a, um, a classification or a regressor that all it needs to do is tell, tell us how much do we need to move right now? How much do we need to calibrate that head sensor? Now, if you're static, there's nothing at all. It'll just output zero. You don't care. The phone is on the table and you're, and you're in a static environment. There's no reason to move the sensor at all. The, the reference, the reference should be static and, the, um, and you use only the head sensor. But if that changes, then this second sensor um, 
will uh, will will tell the first sensor, okay, now you need to start calibrating yourself. What does it mean? You need to move uh, your reference. But where do we move the reference? This is important. We move. We always move it to the same direction. We move it towards where your head is, where your average head is. So if we move it very slowly, we move it very slowly towards the head. If we move it very quickly, like in zero time, we can move it towards the head. That means it'll just be in front of you immediately. And for that split second uh, or several seconds, it could be no tracking at all in that case. So maybe I, I wiggle around and I'm moving and I'm doing this sort of breakdance motion while doing binaural audio with head tracking. The best thing to do in that case is not do any head tracking because it'll just be very, um, very, a very unpleasant experience. But then when, when my motion is sort of um, it stabilizes, then you can release the head tracking again. The amount will go down, the, the, the reference uh, will be uh, released, and uh, it will be stuck in, in, in place, and you'll go back to normal head tracking. And this is what we did. Um, there's a diagram here explaining how this is done, how this, how this takes place. So you can see uh, at the top diagram, you can see that the, 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 the bold line is wiggling from side to side. That's the head. And then there's the, the dotted line is the reference. And you can see the reference is always sort of in the middle of the thing. And, they, uh, and then at the bottom of the graph, you see the user walking and the user taking, at, um, let's say, go back to, to like T5, go all the way to T5. The, uh, the user is taking suddenly a sharp turn left. And when that happens, you can see the amount in the third graph is jumping up. And that causes the dotted line at the top graph. You can see the dotted line at the top graph. It causes it to, to sort of follow a, a very, a very tightly the dark graph. That means that the reference is now moving along with the head. It's just again, it's like it's like a headlock in that case until there's a stabilization. The user again is walking in a straight line, and when when it stabilizes, the reference also goes uh, is released from the head. And you can see at the top graph that the, um, the 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 dotted line is suddenly now in a new position. But it's again, it's always in some some sort of average uh, from the from the head sensor. Um, and this is with dual sensor, and we also have a similar thing with two sensors. With, uh, with sorry, with one sensor. Um, there, I'm not going to elaborate it long because I think we have uh, we don't have a lot of time, and I do want to leave uh, time for questions. But to be very short, um, you can extract the same information. It's a little more difficult, but you can extract the same information from a single sensor, where you need to sort of distinguish: is this uh, normal head motion, or is this motion something that is different from just rotating your head from side to side? Is is the reference changing? And then you extract the amount in the same sort of classification approach, and using that amount, you calibrate. Where do you calibrate to? You calibrate. It's the amount is only a, 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 is only a, the the speed in which you calibrate, but you always calibrate to the same direction, which is the forward direction of the head. Now there's a demo showing this right now. I'll play the video before uh, I'll just explain what you're going to be seeing in the video because I don't think I can talk during the video. You'll see me walking around in, in an environment and um, outside taking turns, and the audio is irrelevant completely. There's not going to be binaural audio or, or any spatialization in the audio. The audio is only to explain what's happening right now. And you'll see me rotating my head from side to side, and you'll also see uh, me moving around, and there's also a section in the car. What you want to follow is on the, on the top left corner, you'll, you'll, see the, um, you'll, see, uh, you'll see the iPhone app that, that's used for this, the mobile app that's used for this, and you'll see the head. And the head, when, I'm, when, when my reference is static, my head, when I'm rotating my head from side to side, you'll see the head moving from side to side. But then when I turn the body, you'll see that the head is quickly adjusting and it's recalibrating or it's, it's, it's sort of going, going to the center for, up forward. And then, and then after I stabilize my motion, you'll see again that I can move my head from side to side. And again, it's, uh, it's doing the head tracking. So follow the head on the left and compare it to what uh, my body is doing in, in, in the movie um, that we're going to show. And next slide. Okay, picking up headphones, putting them on the head, and shake the phone, and look to the left, look to the right, look to the left, look to the right. Now getting up while phone is still on table, and 300 degree turn, no moving reference because phone is on table, looking to the left, looking to the right, picking up phone, and walking towards the path and taking a sharp right turn and then walking in a straight line looking to the right looking to the left 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 
Now taking a sharp right turn around the tree and again looking to the left, looking to the right, looking to the left, looking to the right. Now putting my phone in my pocket. Looking to the right. You can see the phone is in, left, in my hand and as soon as I'm going to put it in my pocket. A sharp turn right. Looking to the right. Looking to the left. Looking to the right. Looking to the left. And I'll start jogging. Jogging a little bit. Looking to the right. Looking to the left. Looking to the right. And sitting down to rest. Looking to the right. Looking to the left. And getting up. Walking towards the table. Looking to the right. Looking to the left. Right. And that's it. Now shooting in the car. Driving in reverse. Not me driving, I'm just sitting next to the driver. Turning to the right. Looking to the right, looking to the left. In a parking lot. Looking to the right. Looking out the window. The car is taking a right turn. Sharp right turn. Looking out the window. And the car is taking a left turn. Still looking out the same window. Still looking out the window. Car took another left turn. Now looking straight. And that's it. Um, yep, that, 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 that's about it. Um, I think right. we have time uh, a little bit for questions. Yeah, if you have, uh, did everyone see the movie? Because I, 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 on the big screen, I didn't see it. Um, I only saw it in the browser, but I think nobody was giving uh, frowning faces. So yeah. I could see it. It was nice to see your uh, real, real life appearance in the movie. Is there maybe one, <laughs> yeah. one question from uh, from the audience? We probably have time for that. All right. Doesn't seem Go like it. Uh, hand raise button if you if you have a question. No. All right. Guess not. Maybe one quick question from me. So, does this dual sensor, uh, these dual sensor applications, also help with IMU drift? And is that still an issue? Yeah, of course. Yeah, on the way, it also solves the IMU drift because mm -hmm. because IMU drift is not a problem anymore once you understand that this is what you want to do anyway. So you, you don't if you're not doing a static environment and you're in mobile environment. So you want to move the you want to move the the, the reference. You want to center it most of the time anyway. As long as your IMU drift is not crazy, right? I mean, if it's if it's a very very bad IMU drift, then it won't solve. But if it's you know, if it's minor, then this solves that problem on the way. That seems like a good have, advantage. Uh, one quick question from Chris Travis. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask. That, that's fascinating and 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 uh, great to see. Thank you very much. It looks really important. 
Um, my question is, does that basically solve this problem? Uh, are, you, are you comfortable that you've kind of um, approaching uh, a solution that's nice and contained and job done? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure. I heard the the, the the entire question. I think he's asking. You're asking if um if we think this solution is is working good enough for us. Yeah. Are yeah. you happy? So yeah, is definitely. Yeah. So definitely, yeah, definitely. The second sensor, the dual sensor algorithm, um, we released it several years ago in the in the, in the phone apps, and it's it's we've gotten very positive responses from you know many 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 users. Uh, it's much better than than other uh, other solutions that I've seen that sort of follow you around all the time. There's solutions that I've seen that they follow you around and that, you know, that solves the problem, but it's an overkill and it's, it's very disorienting in many cases. You don't want that to happen. You want it to be static. Um, and yeah, it's a very robust solution. It's, 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 it's um, we've gotten very, um, very good uh, remarks on it. It solves different, many, many different cases without, uh, without, um, any difference in the algorithm without any settings. So you, it solves the case of boarding a train and also riding a bicycle. It's a very different situation. Imagine walking down the street and, and tying your shoelace or walking with the dog, it's pulling you from side to side. All these cases, when you're doing binaural head tracking in an out, I don't know how many people have experienced this outside when they're walking outside, it's, it's a problem. It's something that you need to think about from a user experience point of view. And this, this totally, it, it totally solves it. Um, we have, People who have been using it for several years years now, and they love it. Great. Okay, thanks a lot. Let's give another one of these. Okay. I guess we can move on to the next speaker. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, I guess we're good to go. Um. Sorry, I just have trouble to launch my slides. Okay. Okay, is Tristan yep. uh, on stage or in the room? Niels, do you see Tristan? He's on stage, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, I have to ask Tristan if you could go on air uh, on your host tools and the on air button. Yep. Okay, I'm still not seeing. Okay. There he is. Okay, yes, now I see you. And then also the uh, amplify voice uh, button on the same host tools. Yep. If you... Yep, great. Uh, can you see my slides though? Because I don't see yes. them on the screen. Yeah, okay, perfect. Great. I guess okay, so we can start. hello everyone. Yep. Uh, so my name is Tristan, and I'm going to talk about a study on adaptation to new auditory localization cues, and I'll be presenting our current advances on a new step to optimize sound localization adaptation with vision. Um, so. Uh, I want to. Can, can you see my slide changing? Because I uh, I cannot. No, I, we don't. We don't see it changing. Um, at least I don't. I think a few people are not seeing it change. Um. Okay. okay should, it should be good now, now, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. So, uh, so the other related transfer functions uh, are used today for binaural, sy uh, binaural synthesis to reproduce uh, auditory spatialized, spatialized scenes. 
And um, so the attractive, they contain the transformation that our body applies to sounds and are thus uh, deeply linked uh, to morphological characteristics. And therefore, attractive uh, are individual and uh, they need to be, uh, and they need to be actually, ah, oh, sorry, I, <laughs> sorry about that. I cannot access my slide. Okay, good. Uh, and so as they need to be individ individual uh, when used, uh, which, which re actually requires uh, special equipment and is uh, very uh, consuming in time. Um, so because of that, uh, today uh, in practical uh, situation, most of the time, uh, uh, HRTFs are used as uh, non-individual HRTF, uh, either generic or measured uh, from someone else's ears. Uh, unfortunately, some specialization with uh, non-individual HRTF leads to unpredictable uh, distortion of the auditory localization. Uh, we observe more front-back confusion and more errors in the precision of the localization. Uh, luckily, uh, our auditory system has the ability to adapt to new HRTF. And indeed, uh, numerous studies uh, have observed that with time and or training, we can improve our auditory uh, localization performance with uh, non-individual HRTF. So this manifests uh, with a uh, decrease in uh, front-back confusions, uh, a, a decrease uh, of the angular errors made in uh, localization tests, and uh, some studies have shown that some of the improvement can be even retained for up to four months after only two sessions of training. And even more interestingly, uh, the improvements that are made uh, in an anechoic an 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 environment and with the training using white noise uh, stimuli can generalize, generalize to untrained positions, different sounds such as the voice, and as well as in uh, reverberant environments. So a great number of uh, training have been used to foster such adaptation. Uh, so the most simple one is uh, just to expose the participants to sound sources specialized uh, with new HRTF. Uh, so although it takes time, it can lead actually to uh, a significant improvement of the localization performance. Uh, more, more specific training have also been proposed where feedbacks are given on the position of the sources, sound sources to um, increase uh, the speed of the training. But the most effective training uh, method that have been proposed uh, are the ones involving an active participation uh, in, act in uh, training task. Indeed, uh, this training, uh, 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 such training has been shown to uh, create a significant adaptation in uh, uh, down to three uh, sessions uh, in, in three consecutive days. Um, and uh, for for example, so, uh, the kind of numbers that we can find is like, uh, so some groups uh, used in uh, the study of Parsayan and cats, uh, who, so we measured 25% of front-back confusions uh, in the localization, localization test uh, before the adaptation, and uh, after three sessions, only 11% uh, of front-back confusion were measured. And these 11% are actually comparable to the ratios uh, measured uh, for the control group using uh, individual HHF before training. So these active trainings are interesting for their results, obviously, but also because they use uh, multisensory feedbacks and an active participation in an exploratory task. And both of these factors have been shown to be beneficial uh, to the memorization of the localization of visual objects. Um, so this program actually can lead to a fast and significant improvement of the auditory, auditory localization performance using either uh, vision or proprioception uh, in addition to uh, vision, uh, audit to addition, but never both together. Um, so although the ability uh, to adapt um, uh, has been shown, we also observed that uh, there it exists uh, a very strong inter-individual differences in the capacity to adapt. And while some participants uh, indeed uh, improve their significantly their performance, uh, some others just uh, do, do not improve uh, during the session. And so one of the possibility is that uh, part of that explanation is linked to the efficiency of the training tasks that are used. Uh, so in that sense, investigating ways to improve the training tasks that are currently uh, uh, used would possibly uh, uh, reduce uh, this phenomenon and at least it will uh, benefit to the participants that are already uh, improving. So we got interested in uh, 
in this training and uh, improving this training. And as I said before, all of this training uh, are bimodal. So they either use vision or proprioception, but never both together. And indeed, it's been shown that uh, vision is not necessary uh, in such training, but still it remains our most precise modality when it comes to spatial localization. And there is many examples of interactions between audition and vision, and even when it comes to uh, auditory localization. For example, the absence of landmarks uh, actually deter deteriorates uh, the localization performance. So what we wanted to uh, see uh, with the study was if a trimodal uh, uh, version of the training would actually lead to a better improvement than uh, a bimodal version. And so, in other words, can vision improve the effect of an uh, audio proprioceptive training task? So now I'll, uh, I'll uh, explain the, the experimental design that we, we aim to use. Uh, this design is uh, inspired by the study of Parson and Katz uh, of uh, 2012. Uh, so the whole experiment was actually uh, carried, uh, will be actually carried out uh, uh, in a virtual environment uh, using an HMD uh, and a Vive controller for the pointing methods. So briefly, so this is the general procedure that we use. So, so before t before actually the training takes place, uh, we uh, a participant they take uh, they carry out an HRTF selection, which allows us to uh, select a specific HRTF. Uh, so this was designed so that. Uh, the groups actually are kind of homogenic because in other studies we notice that uh, if you don't uh, do this task you will have a very very strong uh, interdependent differences uh, at the start of the experiment and this will uh, complicate uh, the analysis later of the results. So then uh, after this uh, selection uh, the participants they carry out a first test of localization that allow us to have a ground measure of their performance with the non-individual HRTF. And then uh, for three consecutive days they participate in a quick uh, training task and then a, a, another uh, localization test aimed to assess uh, their new performance. Uh, so, in order to measure the retainment of the uh, improvement, uh, one week after the last session, uh, we uh, will do another training, uh, another localization test, uh, in order to uh, assess uh, the performance uh, one week after. So, um, to, to study our hypothesis, uh, so we, we create uh, three groups that actually actually are separated by the three different training tasks that I use. So the first group uh, is very similar to the one that were proposed by Parcel and and, uh, and Katz, uh, in the way that we uh, they participate in a bimodal in a bimodal uh, adaptation task. Uh, so they will uh, be given uh, feedbacks uh, in uh, auditory and proprioceptive uh, modalities, um, and then uh, another group uh, will do the same task but uh, with the addition of vision. And so uh, this will allow us to evaluate the influence of vision uh, on, the, on this uh, bimodal task. And then uh, our third group will be our control group uh, where um, uh, the participant will actually, which is actually different than uh, the other studies, they will actually participate uh, in, the, uh, in the training, but they, they will not have any specialized information. Uh, in that way, um, so their auditory system will not be uh, given any information to adapt, and so the adaptation to a charger should be uh, impossible with the training. But still, uh, the interest of that group is that uh, it will allow us to measure the, uh, all the improvements that are, uh, are not connected to the uh, adaptation to HRTF. In other words, uh, it's the improvements that are linked to uh, the familiar familiarization with uh, the procedure and the equipment. So now I will uh, explain to you the different tasks that we use. So the first one is um, uh, so an HRTF selection that allows us to choose the HRTF that each participant is going to use. And this one is inspired by uh, a task proposed by Andrew Poulou and Katz. Um, so the participants will actually have to estimate uh, the realism of trajectories that are prev previously uh, described to them uh, on a Likert scale. This will allow us to have a score of uh, the realism of each tra trajectories. So three tra trajectories are to be tested. 
And uh, in, so in the first, uh, in, the, in the study that was uh, proposed by Andrew Poulou and Katz, they only proposed two tra trajectories. But as you will see later, as we test uh, only the frontal hemisphere, uh, we added a third trajectory to further, um, to have more information about uh, the localization in that, uh, in that hemisphere. So uh, seven HRTF pairs are tested during this task. And after, turning, uh, after this task, so we choose the best HRTF uh, for each participant, which is uh, we do an average of the score, which gives us uh, the best uh, in condition uh, HRTF uh, for them. Uh, also in perfect, this training uh, ca um, allows us to uh, be sh make sure that we do not choose uh, the worst HRTF, and this allows us to uh, to reduce uh, the uh, interdividual differences at the start of the experiment. So uh, to assess uh, the performance of the participants, uh, we use a localization test uh, composed of two blocks of 33 stimuli, uh, all in the frontal hemisphere. So the stimuli that we use is a train of three 40 ms uh, wide nose busts. And uh, the pointing method that we use in this experiment is a uh, manual pointing. So this, this pointing has been shown to be uh, robust and maybe the most um, uh, stable uh, pointing method uh, uh, between uh, the uh, pointing methods such as, as the head, uh, for example, as the head pointing. Um, so uh, then the adaptation task is uh, kind of the key core of this study. So uh, the training session is a 12 minutes uh, mini game of active exploration and the task of the participant is to explore uh, space to find inner targets in the frontal hemisphere. So to do so, uh, they are given a feedback, an auditory feedback, uh, uh, that is actually a white and pink nose alternation. And uh, this alternation is specialized at the controller position in the palm of the end. And the, the speed of the alternation varies uh, with uh, the target to control uh, angular distance. And this allows for a proprioceptive and auditory coupling that actually um, uh, as shown by uh, Parsley and Katz, allows for the adaptation to uh, the, the HRTF. So, um, so as I said, we have three different groups. And uh, so the first group is the one uh, participating in the bimodal uh, version of our training, uh, was assigned specialized and was uh, given uh, proprioceptive information in addition to the auditory ones. Um, then the second group is the one uh, receiving the trimodal version with the addition of uh, visual information. Uh, indeed, the controller is uh, for this uh, for this group. The controller is rendered as a sphere in the, uh, the uh, virtual environment, and um, to so to make sure that the integration is made between the auditory information and the visual information, we had to make sure make sure that uh, the visual information actually helps. Uh, the participants uh, in the task. Uh, in that way, uh, the color of the sphere actually uh, changes uh, act, uh, relative to uh, the target to control the distance. Uh, and as it is uh, a bit like a, a, a cold and old, uh, sorry, hot and cold uh, game, uh, it goes from blue uh, for when it is far of, uh, of the target and red when the participant is closed, is close to the target. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we apply a glow effect uh, to the sphere uh, that is synchronized with the white, pink, and noises intervention. Uh, and because it's been shown that this synchronization of visual uh, information and auditory information actually helps for the integration of uh, these, both of these uh, modalities, and it, it, act it also lowers the atten attentional uh, effort that is needed. And then, as I said before, the control group uh, will do the same task, but with non-specialized auditory information. So um, the uh, measures that we that we collect uh, during this uh, in this study are the ones that we measure uh, during the localization test, and uh, they are uh, me measured in azimut and elevation. Uh, but because we are dealing with a, a non-individual individual HRTF, we expect to have a lot of front-back uh, confusions, will we will kind of parasite uh, our data. And so uh, we need a way to um, actually um, uh, determine 
uh, the error types of, of the uh, of the measurement. Uh, and so uh, to do that, we actually uh, make a conversion from a spherical uh, that is azimuthal elevation coordinates to interoral uh, coordinates uh, that is lateral angle angle and polar angle. And so the data that we are actually uh, applying our stat statistical analysis on are the lateral and polar angle er errors and uh, the error types uh, that is determined thanks to the polar angles, especially for the front back uh, confusion. So unfortunately, uh, we couldn't yet test our uh, hypothesis because of the COVID outbreak. Um, and uh, hopefully in September, we'll be able to uh, to uh, work with participants if the universities in French uh, opens again. But uh, thanks to the literature, we can actually make some uh, uh, predictions. Uh, so um, so what we expect is that both uh, the uh, bimodal and the trimodal tra training task will lead to adaptation. And what we expect to observe is a decrease in uh, polar angle and uh, lateral angle errors throughout these sessions, uh, especially when we compare the first session to the one coming after the third training session. Uh, we also expect a decrease in front back confusion, uh, quite similar to the one, uh, or hopefully stronger to the one uh, observed uh, in, uh, with Parcel and, and, and uh, cats. And we also expect a greater adaptation with vision. So we expect that the improvement and the final performance of the uh, trimodal group will be uh, stronger than the one of the bimodal group. Uh, so now I'll discuss a few perspectives um, of this uh, uh, incoming uh, results and there will be um, another way, to, uh, the first one will be another way to optimize uh, the training uh, method that I use nowadays. And that will be with the implementation of game mechanics to further optimize the active training programs. Uh, so these are have already been tested by Stelman uh, et al. in 2019, but as said by the authors, um, new make game mechanics should be explored uh, to um, improve uh, the um, attention of the participants and the engagement, and that should perhaps, it, there is good indication that it could actually improve the the um, effect of such training. Uh, the last thing that I would like to discuss would be um, uh, actually, an application uh, that uh, is expected uh, that we expect to make a uh, research program, and it, it's also the reason why why we are interested in uh, HHF uh, training programs. So um, the team I'm working with actually uh, is working uh, with post-stroke patients uh, patients that are uh, affected by uh, unilateral spousal neglect. So this syndrome is actually uh, actually manifest by a failure to attend to a side of space and it is found uh, in approximately 30% of the people after a post-stroke. And uh, so um, uh, what we can see, so it, it greatly impacts everyday life and uh, so practically what it is, is that these people are unable to take into account uh, most of the time uh, every information in the left side uh, of the space. And uh, so the, so the most studied uh, part of this is obviously visual. And uh, this can lead to, uh, for example, what we can see in the picture where uh, a whole side of the space is completely ignored. And it's, it's not a perceptual uh, effect, but uh, really an attentional one. And um, recent studies have showed that the auditory localization is also affected, but very differently than the visual uh, information. So, so the auditory localization is affected in a way that on the right side, it is actually quite uh, close to the one of normal people, of non-affected people, uh, with uh, actually good, perform uh, good performance from zero uh, facing the participant and 90 on the right. But then on the left side, what is often found is that every pound on the left side is compressed around the uh, point facing uh, the, uh, the uh, patients. So what we what we want to to explore is if uh, uh, such training that of a rehabilitation of auditory space auditory space can lead actually uh, these patients to uh, rehabilitate uh, their space and um, um, and, and uh, improve their ability to uh, direct uh, their attention on the left side. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, thank you.
Thanks a lot for your talk. Do we have any questions from the audience? Ah, uh, the raise hand button has appeared. Doesn't seem like it. So it was interesting, Alt Space kicked me out during your talk, uh, but uh, it managed to be back <laughs> back in time. Um, maybe one question for me. So do you think that these processes can also work without directed tasks? So just from using, uh, using these renderings right, together with visions? Um. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite understand your question. Like, so um, um, if if we're using generic HRTFs in in an, a, a scenario just as the one right now, mm -hmm. will, will will I also have a chance to learn it? Uh, well, it's quite it's quite possible because actually studies have shown like uh, so some studies have just used um, uh, ear molds to modify the HRTF, uh, and uh, with uh, no training. Uh, with no training whatsoever, and the, part and the participants, uh, so they go uh, through their everyday life with the air molds, and they actually um, adapt to the uh, new HRTF. Uh, but it, it takes more time than with a specific training uh, aimed to that. But of course, um, for example, uh, uh, if uh, you're in a space uh, with a, an a a HMD, uh, you will get uh, visual information linked to auditory, uh, auditory information. So that should allow the, the coupling between these two modalities and that should give information to the auditory uh, system. Obviously, so for the next... Go ahead, sorry. please. No, 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 sorry. Go, go ahead. No, no, no. So for the next conference, uh, we should all do a localization test before and after and, and see if we've learned uh, all space listening now. Yeah, I think <laughs> there might be actually some effect, uh, depending on the time spent. Uh, <laughs> 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 <conference room. laughs> I see. Okay. I guess we would have time for another question. Otherwise, I think we can switch over. Thank you very much. So, thanks again for your talk. Thank you. Now I think to work again. Yeah. Maybe he's hearing his extension. Ah, there he is. Can you hear me? I was not. I was in the wrong time, so. So, Stefan, uh, could you select on air on your host tools? And also. Amplify yeah, it should be on air. So, I'm go right on there. air and amplify my voice. Great. So, is it, is, is it good? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Perfect. Nice. Nice. So I see smiling faces. Perfect. Let's wait for uh, another minute and then. Just one more question while they're sitting up. Does everyone in this room see the slides? No, oh no. 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 Okay. I'm going to I'm going to reset one more time. Once more, do people see the, the title t towards transfer of plausibility? Looks like they have. That looks much better. But mm. no, no, because I, I didn't see them either right now. I don't oh. know. Hmm. So, Stefan, you're not seeing the correct slide deck? No. Uh, no. It's hmm. the one from before. Mm, let's see. Are you seeing it on your own personal browser? The one you're using? Uh, yeah, I have it. Uh, yeah, I have it open. Yeah. So. Okay. Let me just reset the browsers again. Sure. No, but this looks better. So. Okay. I can see the first slide. Okay. Yeah, me too. What What about the people and... in the room? Do we see the this? The yeah, this slides? looks better. Much, much better. Good. All right. I think we have a then let's get a let's get going. <laughs> uh, so I'm happy to introduce my colleague Stefan Wehrle, who will talk about uh, transfer plausibility for evaluating mixed reality audio and complex scenes. And Stefan, the stage is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Niels. Thanks for the introduction. So. Uh, yeah, first, uh, we have a really long title, so to wrap up this a little bit, what we basically did was we uh, we ha had a look into how the presence of resources uh, influenced the ability to detect rendered sources. So, but to explain it a little bit, I wanted to start a small introduction. So, what you're doing when you're evaluating rendering sources, how good they or how well they are perceived, compared to resources, you're doing the evaluation mostly with the paradigms of authenticity, or with plausibility. So on the one hand, you have authenticity, which is, uh, really is a perfect physical reproduction. This means if you have a resource and you're reproducing this resource over headphones, then this is a, uh, then the reproduced source is the identity. So it's the same as the resource in the room. And what you kind of do and, and when, when assessing this kind of test of the authenticity, you basically have a resource, you place it in a room, and you reproduce this source over headphones. And in authenticity tests, for example, you can switch between a real source and, uh, and a rendered source. And basically what you then and um, what you then have to determine if this is basically sounding the same, but this uh, kind of test has some sort of issues. So uh, it's, it suffers from a ceiling effect because in, in authenticity or in the direct comparison, a really small uh, uh, deviation uh, from the resource to the rendered source can be detected. And, but this kind of, of definition uh, is a really strict definition and it's mostly not necessary when reproducing uh, real sources. So there's another paradigm which is called the plausibility. And plausibility means that it is plausible in terms of an inner reference or another definition would be that a simulation is in agreement with the expectation a listener has towards a real scene. So it's not about the comparison, but it's more about the expectation. And this kind of test is also done in a similar way, uh, like the authenticity. But you mostly have, uh, you don't switch, you, don't can, uh, you can't switch between them, for example, but they will be presented one uh, after another. So it can be presented a real source 
and then uh, a render source, render source. And what you have to do is to determine whether this source was then uh, a, a real source or it was a virtualized source. But also in this kind of tests, uh, you just uh, have uh, the presence of one source. So you have one source and this source can either be real or it can be a rendered one. So what is a little bit more, uh, what, what uh, is, uh, uh, yeah, but what uh, the uh, case were, uh, which is yeah more and more practical in some kind of way in mix, uh, for example, in mixed reality is that you have uh, 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 resources coexisting to to virtualized sources, and therefore we ask us the question if um, if a uh, listener or or if uh, uh, if somebody can detect virtualized sources when resources are playing alongside this. Uh, uh, this virtualized speaker. And also this kind of like allows for a controlled comparison. So this is basically uh, uh, um, comparing to the normal plausibility tests we have. We can control them as we have concurrently uh, uh, playing speakers alongside the virtualized source. And that's why we call the transfer plausibility. So that's just a little bit of the explanation what we wanted to assess. So I will start right away with the technical setup. So what we did uh, to assess this test, we used a reverberant room, so it wasn't done in an anechoic room. And it has a reverberation time about 400 milliseconds. And we used a channel like speakers, and we can see how they were placed in the room by one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And also we used an open headphones just to, to, to minimize the influence uh, on the resources of the headphones, and also to, to account for head rotation um, what to account for a little bit deviation of position. We included dynamic head tracking, which we realized with the HTC Vive system, as the HTC Vive system uh, can provide a six stuff tracking or six degrees of freedom tracking, and also has, uh, has low latency and is, uh, should be really accurate. So now to the modification we made to the headphones, we can see them on the right side. So basically this was just uh, removal of the front and the back part of the cushion. And this then should provide more open headphones or should lower the influence of these headphones. And this was also done by Niels, uh, our session chat today. So everybody who's interested should have a look into it. And further, what we then did, we also had a comp uh, compensation filter, but we used non-individualized uh, compensation filter for the headphones as I have to make it clear, the aim in this test was not really to, to, to have a perfect reproduction. And therefore we just go, uh, 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 went with the non-individualized filter. And this filter was then just measured with a KU100 and did uh, in total 24 measurements, took the average, and then derived a um, uh, 256 samples minimum phase filter from it. So what we also did uh, to include the properties of the room is that we did BRER measurements but we just use one single BRER for every of the eight speakers. And this was kind of like measured that we just were facing the frontal direction. So we were looking, we we're sitting in the seat position, then looking towards the, uh, the speaker and then measuring uh, the, the, the uh, binaural impulse response. And again, this one was not individualized. So we used the same impulse response for every of the participants. But what we did, uh, we did a removal of the direct path. So as we uh, render the, the direct path dynamically, as we include the position and we include a binary line and so on, we did an adjustment of the energy. So we adjusted uh, the energy, the DRERs, so the direct to reverberation ratio uh, of them. We adjusted it uh, uh, of, the, of the simulated uh, to, this, uh, to the same ratio that the measured has as the DRER is one of the clues, is one of the big clues you have when, when uh, localizing a sound source. And we also did a time shift so that the early reflections and so on and the river and part is uh, arriving in the same time after the direct path when comparing it to the measured BRDR. So what we then ended up was kind of like, we had then two different rendering methods we used so we had uh, HRTF rendering, which is, uh, which is called here HRTF rendering. And we used for this rendering, we used the headphone compensation and also the dynamic rendering of the direct pass. And we did no externalization in terms of including the, uh, the early reflections or the 
reversible in part, and opposing to this, the better rendering technique, which is by far not perfect. As I stated before, uh, there we included the measured uh, early reflections and also the reverberant part. But also this was just static edit. So uh, for the reverberant part or for the late reflect uh, for the early reflections, there was no adjustment made when uh, moving your head or something. So now to the test itself, what we then ended up is, was different rendering qualities and a varying scene complexity. Now we're coming to the scene complexity. And scene complexity, we are referring it to as one, two, four, or eight speakers can play simultaneously. And here, one speaker can be uh, virtualized. This means when uh, one speaker is playing, it can be virtualized or it can be real. Or in the case of four speakers, three speakers are real and one is virtualized, or also all of the four are real. And we also use different stimuli, so we use music. So we use music uh, from the same track and these were eight different instruments. And we also use speech uh, with form four different languages and with uh, male and female speaker respectively. And we also use the pulse pink noise, which was basically an amplitude modulated signal with eight different frequencies between one and three hertz. So on this slide, we can now see the graphical user interface we used. And what we can see is the green dots and these are the uh, the active speakers which are playing so in the case now for speakers one two five and four uh, were active and this was kind of like to avoid the confusion so that the participant always knew which of the speakers are now present so in the case of just one source it looked like this and what we also did so we had to get rid of a memory memory effect we also did an, an, an randomization of the speaker position so this meant in the case of just one source is playing, uh, it could change from one to another from the fourth source to, to the first source. And also randomization of stimuli. So this means in the first trial, the fourth speaker could play back a, a female French speaker, or also an, uh, or then in the next trial, it could play back an, an male German speakers. And what the participant basically had to do, they had to choose which of the sources is virtualized. So if you think one source is virtualized, you had really select which one of the sources is virtualized. And if you thought that all sources are real, you had to just click the real button. But this was kind of like now long explanation. So right now we will share a demonstration video and I would say if you have headphones, put them on because we did a binaural uh, uh, recording of that. And what you will see, you will also see on the left, uh, left lower side, you will see which speaker is active and also the, 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 the right answer will be indicated. Welcome. You're about to hear part of a listening test. The task of the test was to determine which sound source was reproduced virtually over headphones, while the others are reproduced by real loudspeakers in the room. We will show you the correct answer after each trial. Note that in some cases, only real sources were present. The recording was made using binaural microphones. Thank you. 
So now, hopefully, you have uh, a little bit of an impression how the listing test looks like, and that it could be really hard to determine which one of the sources is virtualized. So now, to the listening test itself, um, we split it up the listening test into into sessions. So we first had a training session with ten trials, where the participant was then trained on the on the different scene complexities and the the on the uh, uh, rendering method and also on the stimuli. And they were also told when they heard an example, which one was the right answer and which rendering technique was used. And the session itself then consisted of, uh, uh, the listening test itself then consisted of two sessions uh, with each of 48 trials. And in each session, we have 24 rendered trials. So where, one, where a virtual source was present and 24 trials where no virtual source was present. And the first session was just uh, made up of HRTF rendering, and the second session was uh, this uh, BRER rendering was used. And the participants were always told beforehand which rendering was used. And also, we had no time restrictions, so they could take uh, as long as they want to guess which of the speakers virtualized or if all are real. And they could move their head freely, so they really could look over the shoulder could go a little bit around, but not too much, but have to uh, stay seated. Uh, but but they really could not turn on the on the on the chair. And luckily, we had the chance to conduct this listening test a second time because in the first test, uh, Corona had. But in the second time, we were able to have 15 participants and three were female and 12 were male. And all of these uh, uh, participants can be recognized as experienced listener as they were all as they're all working in audio or in a spatial audio field. So I will go now right on to 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 the results. So what we can see here now from the results is the mean of uh, right answers for different scene complexities, so for different uh, number of concurrent planning sources. And on the left hand side, we have the first session, the results of the first session. On the right hand side, we have the results of the second session. And the, the, the plots itself are made up of three parts. So on the left hand side, we only included the results where a virtual source was present. In the middle part, we only included the results where only resources were able. And on the right part, uh, we then combined both of the results. And we can see that even for for oh and the, and the dashed line is just the chance level for one, two, four, and eight sources playing. And then we can see even for HRTF, we see a decline in accuracy. So we see that it just uh, declines from about 100% of right uh, answers to down to uh, approximately 63% with eight sources. And this is even for 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 a really yeah, basic rendering. So this should be really a baseline rendering what we had here. And this effect is even more dominant for the BRER rendering. So we have kind of an offset towards uh, less correct answer uh, uh, examples or less correct answer trials. And but what we can see here is still that it is above chance level. Uh, but this should then also be um, can be due to the fact that uh, that we use Basically, it's a media core rendering. And, but what's kind of interesting is if you look at the uh, only BRER, so the only virtualized samples for the BRER rendering, we can see that it's easier to, to guess uh, uh, if a um, source is virtualized when, when two sources are present. So when a real source is playing alongside a virtual source. So because uh, uh, for, for only one source is playing, we see that it's, uh, it's uh, the it is at about chance, so it is harder to detect uh, uh, virtualized sources without the presence of a real source. But this effect then vanishes if we adjust, if we hire the uh, scene complexity. So on the next slide, it's again uh, uh, the mean and, oh, sorry, I didn't set that as the confidence interval before, so uh, this is also a 95% confidence interval. And what we have uh, again is for different stimuli. So what we can see from the plots is that is for music and speech, we basically have the same uh, accuracy or the same rate of correctly answers. But for pulse pink noise, this deviates a little bit. So if you look at the HRTF rendering and the middle plots, so 
for the results where only real sources were active, you see that the detection rate is lower compared to, 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 to music or speech. But this could already be explained with the influence of the headphones. So what we, what we, what we saw or what we have was some kind of shadowing effect of the headphones when turning the lateral side towards a playing speaker. And this then sounded a little bit like the source's virtual, so it sounded a little bit weird. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, right. And then for PRR rendering, we even have the oppos uh, opposing effect. So for PRR rendering, we see uh, that the pass pink noise in case of only virtualized sources, we see that the that the, the detection rate is much higher compared to music and speech for pass pink noise. But this was mostly due to uh, due to the coloration as the uh, as the early reflections and the rear and tail would introduce some coloration and then it makes them much easier to 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 detect the virtualized source. So for the for the next plot um, we see basically the BRER running but it's a little bit more detailed. So what we can see here so we have uh, we have we have from the first uh, the first error or the upper error is pointing at the uh, at the virtual uh, the virtual play uh, sorry at the real uh, at the real playing source but it was guessed as a virtual source and this is for one speaker and in the and the more dominant so sorry perhaps just say the color so the and the outer ring the darker red is a real source playing but it's the amount of these resources playing detected as a virtual source. And the a little bit brighter orange or red is a virtual source, which was then detected as a real source. So this means we have kind of a bias towards a real source. So we are more prone to detect a virtual source as a real source. And this was also observed by, by plausibility paper or plausibility evaluations before. But if you now look at two speakers playing, so if we are if we add one speaker alongside the one speaker's playing, this bias then vanishes. So now they are basically the same. So we have not really a bias towards a real or a virtual source. And if we if we even then uh, uh, higher this complexity, this bias vanishes. So we can see that then the amount so <clears throat> amount of 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 uh, real real sources uh, estimated as virtual is a little bit higher or is higher and then this bias for just one source then vanishes. But this could uh, then already also explain with a little bit of the confusion of participants, because in the case of eight speakers, often there was a lot of confusion and then they just clicked on some of the parts of the GUI and this was more prone to, to just click on a virtual source, just to detect the virtual source. So what we then had, uh, yeah, we then had a start, couple of observations we made during the past that have to be uh, yeah, I looked into or, or have to be taken into account is also a uh, use of stimuli test. Uh, what we, what we uh, saw is that in some cases there were stimuli, so there were some stimuli which sounded like a virtual source, even if they were real. So this was, for example, uh, there was an, 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 an saxophone that said really just is playing an onset, and this was often just a, a, a guess as a virtual source, even if it was real. So perhaps this has to be taken into account. And also the influence of the speaker position. So if two, uh, if they're a little bit nearer to the listener or further away, but I think we or we should have uh, minimized this effect by randomizing the speaker position. Also, in some cases, the influence of the tracking system should not be neglected. So normally the tracking system was really fast and this should not be detected. But in some cases, it seems that the that the processing power uh, was a little bit low, and there was sometimes delay introduced, which then also helped to detect the virtual sources. And also, the influence of the headphones should be uh, recognized. And what we also uh, 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 seen, or when what was seen when we looked uh, into 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 the particular uh, uh, results of uh, form participants is that we have some kind of an, an learning effect. So with an ongoing time, the listener seems to be more uh, seems to identify virtual sources more reliable. And this could also be due to the fact that they were all experienced listeners, and after a while, they just know which cues to listen to. And also, one question is for a high complexity, if the main effect is, set as, uh, is just spectral masking. So if this, uh, if the detection rate uh, or the, 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 
the uh, main effect is back to mask. And, but this is kind of like a thing somebody has to look into uh, in the future. And we did not uh, do this uh, in this paper. But right on now to just to summarize this, uh, what we did in this test, we did more or less a framework for the transfer, what we call transfer plausibility, because I think there's open or there's room for discussion uh, for this kind of uh, uh, for this kind of naming. And we could also have a reduction of the ceiling effect. So we did not really have a ceiling effect, even if we had a controlled comparison and this reduction in terms of comparing it to an authenticity test. And our results we had, they suggest that we have a lower identification rate when we are using more real speakers concurrently playing to, to virtualized sources. So this could also then mean that we don't have to use perfect rendering uh, when, when, when we are in re mixed reality or something and we have concurrent playing resources. And what then could also be done as an outlook for, for, for further research is perhaps use native listeners how they react to this, because right now we just had experienced listeners and they were all really, they knew which clues to, to, to listen to. And also basically with better reproduction method, as I said before, we didn't use, it was just a media core reproduction, but this also um, resulted in um, relatively, relatively good results, I would say. And what should also be included in future work is signal detection theory. So we wanted to include the signal detection theory, but this was more like due to due to uh, due to time reasons, and we would then plan if we if we further investigate this, we would then include this. And with that, I'm done with my presentation, and thank you for your attention, and I'm open for questions. Thanks, Stefan. So, do we have any questions from the audience? Once the race has disappeared. Does not seem like it. I'm not sure if raising the hand is possible already. But, ah, someone raised. There's, there's someone back there. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I can. Yes, let's just wait a second and see if Dustin will amplify your voice. Uh, so for some reason, I'm not able to... Can I do it too? No. Let me just uh, wait one second and check. Our technical, technical chair has left. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It is late in the conference. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's have uh, was that was that Maximilian asking the question? I think so. Yeah. yeah. What, what? Wait, wait. I'll come. Uh, I'll make sure I can hear you, and then I'll re repeat it. That's a good uh, idea. Thank you. Where are you? Ah, there you. Hi. Oh, here he is. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Found directions very different um, okay. compared to uh, yes. Okay, okay. I think I can repeat That's my that. question. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I think I also I just put him on air also. So uh, yeah, in case I, you can't I heard a little the bit whole of thing. It. Yeah. Uh, he could say it again. Uh, <laughs> I, so I was wondering about the impact of um, the head movements. If if you could um, observe any differences between people who, who had their head almost static or people yeah. who moved all the time. So because of two impacts of the tracking system on the one hand, on the other hand, um, because then you perceive directions differently. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. I, th I think so that, uh, that, the, um, uh, that the people who really moved 
around a long and really, really, really tried for a lot of positions and a lot of movement, we're able to easy, easier uh, detect the virtual source. So this is kind of like also a thing then I thought about afterwards, because perhaps it should be, uh, it should have been done that the, the rotation or the amount of rotation should be then uh, uh, just a little bit more strict. But I think there, there was uh, an effect. I, I can't say for sure, but it seems like, yeah, yeah. Wasn't there even logging of the directional data that could be looked at? Uh, uh, yes, I think so, yes. Uh, but I have to, to look this up because still have the data. Okay. But yeah, but it seems like, because it was like I, I was in the room and, and just uh, uh, observed the participants. And it seems like the people who were really, really uh, into it to detect the virtual source did a lot more movement and then were uh, more more able to detect the virtualized source. Yes, yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I guess it's 1030 at least here in Central Europe and time to stop. Thank you all for listening. Thanks to all the speakers for the interesting talks. Yes, and one more round of applause, of course, here for Stefan. All right. Okay. An applause for uh, the session chair. Uh, yes, and thank, thank you, you also for sharing the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. So enjoy the rest of the conference.